I now have the pleasure of introducing many wonderful people to the stage. First, director Jeffrey Schwartz. Co-producer and editor Philip Harrison. <laughs> Next, Charles Russo, Vito's brother. <laughs> Followed by the wonderful. Phyllis Antonellis, Vito's cousin. <laughs> Next, Arnie Kantrowitz, Vito's friend and his co-activist in the biographer, the author of Celluloid Activist, Michael Scheibe. Hello, good Hello. evening, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I know that there are, I'm sure, thousands of questions from the audience. I will start our Q&A with a few questions of my own, I have many. Um, Jeffrey, you, you said in your introduction that Vito seemed to be a person who was quite the archivist himself and left many records that would make it easy to tell this story, but um, one of the really fascinating things about your documentary is that there is so much great archival footage in it, and I'm thinking particularly here of that phenomenal rally at Washington Square Park with Silvio Rivera and Bette Midler. Could you talk about how you found that, and how much time went into finding everything that came together to make this film? Um, first of all, it's a great honor to be here at the New York Film Festival. Thank you again for having us. And, uh, you know, I have to say that it all started with uh, working on the Slaylet Closet, uh, Rob Epstein and Jeffrey Friedman's film. I'd read the Slaylet Closet uh, when I was coming out. Vito had just passed away. I came out in about 91. And um, uh, I heard that Rob and Jeff were going to be making a film about it. And I, um, I said, I want to come out and sweep the floors or do whatever you need. And, and they said yes. And, um, and then HBO came on board to, to produce the film with that. So it was, it was during that period where I got to know Vito the activist because I knew his work as a film scholar. But Rob and Jeffrey had collected all this material and had interviewed Vito. And that's what makes up um, a bulk of the film. I mean, all those interviews with Vito are from either from Common Threads or from uh, pre-interviews they did with Vito for Common Threads or for the Silent Closet. So um, I guess it's with just a word of mouth, hearing about things that existed, um, talking to, uh, looking at other documentaries, Arthur Dong's uh, of Rage 69 also had some of that footage and told some of the same stories. And I don't know, I, I, it's, it's watching a lot of other documentaries, really, um, and uh, working with uh, libraries and uh, archives in New York, LA, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So this stuff is out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we would find something, it, that was a miracle. We would all jump for joy around the office, and, and then, of course, the Philip we found a way to incorporate it into the film. Mm -hmm. And uh, my next question is for Phyllis and Charles. You speak so pointedly about the films that Vito loved, and I want to know what what films didn't Vito like? Did he have? He had many passions, but were there any actors or movies that he just said, "Oh, this is terrible"? I'm sure he must have been as passionate about his hate as he was about his loves. Um, I. I I'm so out of my comfort zone with the Brainiacs on this panel. Um, I, I find it, I get so emotional even now when I even think about Vito. He was so special to us, so my heart gets in the way of my tongue. Um, uh, I, I don't really recall Vito having idols, and um, 
he was just so uh, intent on when he got involved with finding the the injustice of the homosexual depiction in movies. Um, I don't remember him really having an idol or a pinup or anything of that sort. That's what he made. Um, Did I he have anybody on a dartboard? <laughs> no, that's what I'm thinking. Like Jesse Helen. Uh, yeah. But I'm not surprised because I was I was the official babysitter of Charles and his brother because I was nine years still older. <laughs> and still, um, so I was just at the right age. So I became the babysitter, and Ann Ann, who was my mom's younger sister, we were really friends. Uh, she was my confidante. And so I was really very close. And I, I just want to say, Beatles are despising injustice so much. I remember, if I'm allowed to take this much time, oh, please. being in his babysitter, his dad had painted the apartment once. And for some reason, Vito was left unattended in the house. And he got locked in the bathroom because of the wet paint. And in his attempt to open up the window, um, he dropped a glass bottle of ammonia. He was being asphyxiated. And in his swift mind, he was only eight or nine, and he broke the bathroom window. And of course, when his dad came home, he got somewhat of a beating, Charles' <laughs> plastic bag. And so, you know, when the next time they babysat, he wanted to go and buy oak tag because he made a poster of his dad wanted for Buddha the Soul. <laughs> With a, with a lethal weapon, and he was a small boy, and I said, Vito, how did you know those words? And he said, I saw a wanted poster in the post office. <laughs> Someone was wanted for beating and assault with a, with a deadly weapon, and he proceeded to get an old tag and draw a picture of his dad and wrote one And he so said, I don't care about the physical abuse. It was just unfair. I was in survival mode, and I was hit for trying to save my life. And when I watch this, I think, my God, that childhood experience was so, it was just natural for him to grow up and fight these injustices. And I know I'm talking long, but I want to just say that Jeffrey Schwartz and the intensive research and the love and the devotion, and I'm so happy to see Vito's all friends all here alive and well today. It does my heart good, and I'm just honored that you have me on your panel today. Thank you. You know, after seeing the film, and you know, I always get emotional, and I've seen it a few times. Uh, I think I'm going to go home and check our records because I think he was triplets. He was everywhere, my brother. And, um, I would like to say this. I want to thank, of course, uh, Jeffrey and his incredible staff. They were just so wonderful through this entire process. I want to thank HBO. I want to thank the New York Film Festival. I really do. Uh, uh, HBO, it's, it's wonderful having them on board because this is going to reach the mainstream and it really needs to reach the mainstream. One thing I want to say is Vito was very fortunate because he was sort of the perfect storm. He had a loving family who supported him in a time when it was a very difficult time where, where young men and women were being thrown out of their houses and disowned. So he had a very supportive family. And then he was very fortunate because he found his close gay family, Arnie and Larry. And, and I just want to, you know, for me to be up here and Larry Kramer to not be up here is just an injustice. Larry, I just want to say this to you. I'm so happy to see you here tonight. But this is the year of Vito with the book out about Vito that Michael did so wonderfully. And uh, you know, the only thing I would like to uh, mention is one of the things that, again, I said this once before, uh, that jumped out of Michael's book. There was an early um, GAA meeting, and there was some arguing back and forth about. Uh, politics in terms of changing laws. And Vito says, I know we have to change laws, but he said if we really want to change people and change their hearts, we have to do it through the media with positive images. And um, just to see this now, uh, Vito's having his wish. So thank you all for being here. And it's wonderful.